So let me get started. Um, there is a, a problem with the way uh, the United States is, is going. The, the trajectory right now is very troublesome to me. Um, I, I can list several problems that we have in different areas. Probably none of these are going to be that surprising to you, but um, there's sunshine at the end of the presentation, so bear with me. Well, first, the first thing, uh, in my view, is there's a, a huge bloated government. It's, it's grown tremendously over time, as you, as you all know, and not always, uh, you know, for the better. So a, f a few things that I, I noticed when I was uh, doing a little research for this, this presentation was, do you know how many hundreds of uh, individual federal agencies there are? It goes on for pages and pages and pages. And some of those agencies you've never heard of, of course. And I'm going to guess that some of them don't do things that we care about or want to have done, but it's hard to tell. Um, another thing that, that's a problem right now, and it has been a problem for, for many years, I think, in a lot of different federal agencies, inefficiency and failure are, are uh, simply rewarded with more money. We'll throw more money after something when it doesn't work. So we'll just, you know, that's how we'll fix it. Uh, another area is accounting standards. I know this sounds kind of boorish, and, and, uh, but a business is re required to have uh, to, to keep track of their gross receipts and how they spend their money and so forth using general accounting methods. The federal government has no such rule. So they get money into their, their budgets, they spend it, and they make sure they spend it all because they don't want their budget to go down the next year. Another area that's, that's a problem, oh, and by the way, the, the, uh, there is a budget process that, that uh, the Congress is supposed to follow, and it has been followed occasionally, but not, uh, only, only twice since 2010 have, have they actually used the budget process. Instead, it's, it's uh, continu you know, con continuing resolutions, you know, just throw, throw some more money into it and keep going, make sure the government does shut down. So not exactly efficient. Um, and the result of all this spending, of course, is massive borrowing, uh, you know, borrowing from our future, from our kids' future and our, our grandchildren's future. So this, this little graph here is something you probably are fairly familiar with. This particular one was, was uh, done by the uh, Federal Reserve, and it shows that our total uh, public debt at, at the end of 2020 was $27 trillion. Well, you know, since, tw since 2020, um, the recent report says we've gone up another $2 trillion just this year alone. So I ask you, how, how, how long can this go on before something really bad happens? Um, somebody, somebody's financing this debt. We're lucky right now that the, uh, the interest rates are low enough that, that the economy can handle it, but at some point, Something's got to give. Uh, th this graph shows you uh, public trust in, in the federal government. And trust in the federal government recently is down in the, in the 20s. And this is done by Pew, Pew, Pew Research. So they are, uh, you know, in my view, are not, you know, a right-wing organization. They're very likely, uh, th these numbers are probably worse right now than, than they have been in forever. So I if it's, in 21 it was tw you know 24% it shows there. Um, somebody told me that this, uh, this same organization said it was you know, down in the teens now. So I don't know, I can't verify that. But anyways, not good. So why is there a lack of trust? Well, I can give you, uh, you know, a whole list. I've got slide after slide of things that, that uh, cause people pause. Uh, the very first one on my list is the mismanagement of the COVID pandemic. And, you, you know, of course, COVID is a bad disease and, and we wanted to control it. And, and I'll give them credit. They didn't know what they were dealing with in the beginning. But my gosh, I don't think anybody is going to be giving anyone any rewards for how this was handled when it's all over. 
Um, another one on my list is the incompetent and humiliating withdrawal from Afghanistan. I don't know how you feel about it, but I, I felt terrible, you know, when those, those young people were killed in the last day as we're, you know, being thrown out like a bunch of, you know, cowards out of Afghanistan. I just couldn't stand it. So anyway, um, another one, suspicion that the last, the last election was stolen. Well, I don't know. The problem is we don't have any confidence in it. You know, maybe perfectly pure uh, uh, snow, but the lack of uh, curiosity on both sides of the aisle about how the election uh, went last time, to me, was very troubling. Uh, I keep going through the list here. I've got <laughs> two or three slides of these things. Um, unelected bureaucrats put in charge of things decided by, should be, that sh should be decided by the people or the states. I mean, we've all heard the, uh, the stories of you know, some uh, poor rancher somewhere who's got a, a, a mud puddle out there that the, the feds are trying to regulate as navigable waters, things like that. It's crazy. Um, I, uh, no one likes the lockdowns and manda you know, mandates that, that have been foisted up upon us in the last few years. Um, well, last two years, I guess I should say. Um, it, it could be worse. Uh, you know, it could be like Australia, where a friend of mine told me uh, her mother had to um, use a QR code on her phone to get into the grocery store, you know, to prove that she was, uh, you know, vaccinated. That sort of thing. So, anyway, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go any more into the, on this slide. I'll get some more. Um, I I question whether. The, the bulk of politicians really have the best interests in mind, at least the, the politicians in D.C., let's just put it that way, have the best interests of the people in mind. There's so much uh, anecdotal evidence of corruption in D.C. that is just, well, I just can't stand it. Uh, I, I uh, heard uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who's a, uh, a Democrat, say that when she got to D.C., that her, her first week there, they told her, this is how it's going to be. You know, we give you the list of bills that you're, going to, that you're going to vote for, and you have to vote for them. And she said, but I've got my own bills. Well, her bills won't, get, won't be considered unless she votes for the other bills first. So and it, and I, I'm not blaming the Democrats for this one. I think this is probably true on both sides of the aisle. So this is a nonpartisan kind of issue here. Um, the other thing about um, you know the political climate right now is that uh, politicians seem to be making it a, a you know a lifelong uh, career choice rather than the, you know what the founders uh, envisioned, which was citizen politicians who went you know went to uh, Washington and served and then came home. Well. As you can tell, you know, 95% of uh, senators always get reelected. So we end up with, with folks that are there 20, 30, 40 years. And of course, they're beholden to people for the money that uh, it takes to get reelected. So it's messy. In my, in, my, in my view, we could probably do better if, if we had term limits. And you'll hear more about that later. But um, the other thing that is going on. See it, you see it in the news all the time, or at least some of the news, depends on where you're, you're looking. Uh, there seems to be two sets of justice systems for, for us right now. We've got the people that are well connected in DC that are uh, held to one standard, and the rest of us are held to another standard. And guess which one is uh, you know, tougher on you if, you if you violate something. But it gets worse. Uh, the federal government is broken, but, but so is the, the culture of the country. Um, for decades, uh, we've been sliding further and further away from what the founders uh, envisioned for, for our country in terms of culture. You know, the, the country was, was founded on Judeo-Christian values, which are, um, regardless of what religion you believe in, are kindness to each other and looking out for each other and things like that, not uh, looking for the government to 
take care of you. They're supposed to be um, self-sufficient uh, citizens going about your business. That we're so far away from that in some areas of the country that it's just really sad. Um, another thing that's, been, that's sort of been creeping in lately and that, and that is the, uh, the woke culture. Um, the woke culture has come in, it's done all sorts of things, changed the language, changed you know, how many genders there are, you, know, you can go on down the list, but in the, in the name of diversity and inclusion, you see the exact opposite. I mean, it's basically, you have to watch what you say. If you say the wrong thing, you lose your career or your, your job at least. Um, if you have skin that's not the right color, that can be held against you. Um, Martin Luther King, I think, would be horrified at, at what some, of, some aspects of our culture are today. Um, Another thing that seems to be a bad trend is parents are starting to complain more and more about the fact that they have less and less to say about how their kids are, are, are taught in the schools. Um, most, most people don't want critical race theory taught. So we're, we're headed that way in a lot of places. Uh, some places that have you know, put their feet down and said, no, there'll be no critical race theory taught in our schools, but you have to wonder the culture isn't really uh, going to cooperate with that. I suspect it's still being taught, uh, you know, behind your back, in, at least in some schools. Uh, another thing that bothers me personally is that uh, in the name of science, we're doing all kinds of, of things that have nothing to do with science. It's all about politics and very little to do about science. Um, and and you, can, you can come up with the list yourself, I'm sure you've... You have your opinions on this, but but for for me, the the masks are one thing. You know, uh, Mr. Fauci or Dr. Fauci, whatever his name is, he's flip flopped on masks so many times, uh, makes your head spin. So, are masks effective or are masks not effective? Uh, it kind of depends on uh, the day of the week and and who you talk to. Uh, same thing with the vaccine. I mean, I think the vaccine has served a purpose, but is it, is it so uh, great that uh, you should take away people's rights to say, no, I don't want it? And I think the answer for me is no, I'm not doing it. And what, you know, data is starting to emerge showing the vaccine is damaging the very people it's supposed to protect. And along with it, the masks, what, what are masks doing to children? You know, you know, a mask on, on a very young child robs them of the opportunity to see the facial expressions of their teachers and their, and their other uh, students. And I think it's, the long-term effects of that are, are going to be not good, my opinion. So is our, is our uh, democracy failing us? That's the question that, that I hear. Um, and w what I would refer uh, people to is the fact that, and many uh, younger generation don't know what form of government we really have. We don't really have a democracy. Uh, so I, what I, in the next slide, I'm gonna show you what the difference is between a democracy and, and what we have today. The close of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, Legend has it that a woman called out to Benjamin Franklin to ask what kind of government the delegates had created. Franklin responded, A republic, madam, if you can keep it. A republic? Shouldn't Franklin have said, a democracy? Isn't that what we have in the United States? Most people today would say yes. After all, if our country isn't a democracy, what is it? It's not a dictatorship, the rule of one man, or an oligarchy ruled by a small group. In America, the people are in charge. That's literally what democracy means in the original Greek. Demos, kratos. The people, demos, rule, kratos. But let's pause for a moment and consider more deeply what the word means in practice and why the delegates in Philadelphia rejected it. That's right, rejected it. Our government was established by a national charter, the Constitution of the United States. We are governed by the institutions and according to the rules and principles created and adopted when our forebears ratified that document, making it the supreme law of the land. Are those institutions, properly speaking, democratic? 
The men who bequeathed our form of government to us, those we call our founding fathers, didn't see it that way. They understood the institutions established by the Constitution to be Republican. In fact, though the founders believed in government of the people, by the people, for the people, as Abraham Lincoln put it in the Gettysburg Address, they did not believe in pure or unrestricted democracy. They feared that democracy, strictly speaking, contained within it the impulse to mob rule, the stifling of civil liberty, the trampling by majorities of the rights of minorities. To put it more bluntly, pure democracy frightened them. So while they built into the Constitution significant democratic elements, they also built in non-democratic features to protect liberty and prevent tyranny. It wasn't simply that they favored representative government over direct democracy, though they did. It's that they rejected the idea that the majority wins was by definition the just outcome. Indeed, in what is perhaps the most famous of the 85 Federalist Papers, Federalist 10, James Madison, precisely in distinguishing a democracy, which he did not favor, from a republic, which he did, noted that a crucial advantage of republicanism is to refine the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may best discern the true interests of the country. And so we have representative government, and more than that, we have a bicameral, that is, two-tiered legislature, a Congress with a highly democratic House of Representatives and a not very democratic Senate. Therefore, California, with its massive population, has 52 representatives in the House. Wyoming has one. Yet Wyoming has two senators, the same number as California and every other state. A pure Democrat would say, that's unfair. Each Wyoming resident has far more power than every Californian. But a Republican would say, well, we aren't and shouldn't be a pure democracy. If we were, large population states like California would overwhelm the needs and interests of small population states like Wyoming. That's why we're called the United States of America. Each state has its own separate identity, holds its own separate elections. Just as we don't want one person or small group of people to dominate our government, we don't want one state or a few states to dominate our government. A republic is a way of diffusing power, and a brilliant one at that. We see something similar in the Constitution's procedures for choosing a president. An obvious possibility would have been by a national popular vote. The founders wisely decided against this option. Rather, they created an electoral college to protect the interests of the less populous states. Even today, their decision makes sense. As my Princeton colleague, Professor Alan Gelzo, observes, a direct national popular vote would incentivize campaigns to focus almost exclusively on densely populated urban areas. The electoral college system incentivizes candidates to court voters more broadly, making presidential elections more fully national. So if we understand the system of government our founders bequeathed to us, we will see why they preferred to describe it as a republic rather than a democracy. Of course, it has strong democratic elements, but America was not created to be a pure democracy for very good reasons. Those reasons remain as valid today as they were in 1789. We should not go along with those who today are demanding constitutional changes simply because this or that institution or procedure established by the Constitution, say the Senate or the Electoral College, is not democratic. More democratic doesn't necessarily mean better. It doesn't necessarily mean more just. Our founders understood this. So should we. We have a republic, and we should keep it. I'm Robert George, McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program at Princeton University for Prager University. This video was made possible by a generous donation from the William S. Knight Foundation. Thank you for watching this video. To keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. Next video is to, to uh, talk about Article 5, which uh, gives us the, the, gives the citizens the right to come up with uh, uh, amendments to the Constitution. Article 5 provides two ways to do it, actually. One, one is through the, the Congress, and one is through uh, the individual states. So uh, the, 
fat chance getting anything through Congress because they, you know, they're the ones that like things the way it is. So what Article 5 gives us the opportunity is if, if uh, two thirds of the states agree on a particular uh, call for a convention of states, then a convention of states is called. And it's called to consider uh, the very specific um, areas in the, in the call, um, which in, in the case of convention of states, uh, the organization, we have three things that we're trying to do. One is term limits. One is uh, government overreach, and one is uh, fiscal responsibility. So anything that comes up that's outside the, the scope of those three areas would be automatically rejected. But anything that fits in those three areas is, could be potentially used uh, as a, a suggestion or a, a, a suggested amendment to the Constitution, which would then go out for uh, ratification and if it was ratified by 34 states, or excuse me, uh, 37 states, three, three quarters, I think it's 37, uh, then it would actually become part of, part of the Constitution. So uh, this, this uh, video I've got here gives you an idea what the founders were thinking about, or the, the, the framers of the Constitution were thinking about when they put Article 5 in there. So let me play this. Imagine you were in this room, we're in Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the very place where the Constitution was done and the Declaration of Independence. I'm Rick Green, America's Constitution Coach, here with Mark Meckler. And Mark, if you had been in this room, when it happened, when the Constitution was created and George Mason stands up at the very end to say, hey guys, wait a minute, we messed up, we got a real problem here, what would you do? I'd have probably been irritated. <laughs> Sit down. You hear the grumbling, right? right? Yeah, They're like, like let's, let's go home. home. Man, it's two days. September 15, 1787, two days before the end of convention. You guys have heard the story. It's hot in here. Yeah. Like they didn't have HVAC back then, so it's hot. The windows are boarded up. They're all irritated by now. They want to go home. Mason stands to address the men and he says, we have a terrible problem with the document we've drafted. I can hear the groans now. Yeah, everybody's like, oh, Here George again. again right? yeah. And he says, we've given the power to the federal government to propose amendments should they deem them necessary, but we've not given the same power to the people acting through the states. Now I gotta stop you there, back up. They've been here for all those weeks to create a federal government. They've redesigned the whole thing. The constitution is designed. Here's our three branches of government. Here's what states can do. Here's what federal government can do. They created all of that. And he's saying, wait a minute, we have a problem. Yeah, and there's a, a little bit of lost history in there. Actually, the very first draft that went out to the working committees contained this power. The states had the power. I didn't know that. The federal government didn't, actually. And when it came back, somehow it had been reversed. And so he notices this at the last minute, literally, brings this problem up. Everybody groans, we think. We don't have the videotape, right? But then he asks a question that I think is the real question. And this question resonates across the ages. He says, are we so naive that we believe that a federal government that becomes a tyranny will ever propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny? Now wait, let me put that in country boy language. I'm a country boy. That means if the federal government ever gets out of control, do we really think the very people that stole power, that took it without permission, We'll just give it back. We'll just hand it off to us. You know, whenever I tell this story in a hall or in a meeting somewhere, people will laugh. Yeah. And I think that's probably what they did. You know, we don't have a recording. You can kind of tell. Madison's notes in that point, they say nin com. It's Latin for no comment, essentially. That's an abbreviation. No debate. These no guys de debated everything. That's the 1787 version of mic drop. Exactly. Right? No, like, <laughs> I call it the forehead slap. Like everybody just went, oh my gosh. We missed that. I can't believe we missed that. And so Eldridge Gary proposes the second part of Article 5, gives the states two thirds of them power to call and convene a convention of states for proposing amendments. Then the vote's taken. I think this part's incredible. Imagine them in this room, right? Ready to go home. It's unanimous. unanimous. Absolutely. So it was so obvious to them that we had to give this power to the people acting through the states that there's no debate and it's unanimously adopted. Now let's just summarize that real quick. So they created the Constitution, they created the three branches of government, they created all these different levels of accountability, and they said, we didn't solve everything. In the future, there will be issues. This will need to be amended. Congress can propose amendments and send it back to the states 
and they ratify it. And what George Mason changed, what they actually put in there at the end is the states can propose amendments. The states come together and propose amendments, and then it goes back to all the states to be ratified. And unanimously, they said, that's a good idea. We need that second mechanism. Yeah, and important to remember what that means is they gave the ultimate power not to the federal government, not to Washington, D.C., but to the people in the states. Thank you, George Mason. So here it is, Article 5 is really simple language. It can be read by anybody. It's less than a page. And the stuff I've got, uh, oh, sorry. Here, here, here we have Article 5, a page of text, pretty simple, uh, you know, straightforward English for uh, the average person doesn't take a PhD to read it, or a lawyer. Uh, basically it says here that, you know, if you've got, if the legislatures of uh, two thirds of the states come up with a, uh, identical calls for a convention and uh, that's what we're proposing is I, getting that many states to call, call a convention um, and then uh, the, that convention will come out of that will potentially come one two three you, you, you put the number there uh, of individual amendments that will go uh, out for ratification to the states and if it's ratified by three quarters of the states then that becomes part of the, the Constitution. So the, uh, the balanced budget amendment would be one that would fit in this, this framework, for example, if, if you wanted that. So this brings me to the Convention of States mission. So our, our mission as Convention of States is to build a grassroots army. Uh, and we're, we've been uh, working at this for uh, you know, several years. We've got 15 states, 17 states, that's right, two more were just, were just uh, added to the list in the last couple weeks. We have 17 states going in that direction, but as I mentioned before, we, uh, the, the calls are for fiscal responsibility, stopping government overreach, and term limits. So it's got to fit in those three. And if it does, then, then it'll be considered as a, a possible amendment and sent out for, for consideration by the states. So our primary mission, therefore, is to build an engaged army of self-governing grassroots activists. You say, well, what does that have to do with, with uh, calling a convention? I thought you were trying to call a convention. Well, we are trying to call a convention. A convention is a very necessary part of getting the, uh, the amendments passed. But it's only part of the of the the whole picture. You know, I mentioned before we've got cultural problems. We've got all kinds of stuff going on in our country, where we need the individuals to stand up, to get off the sofa, you know, get involved every day to do something about this. The the opposition has had you know uh, years and years, decades actually, uh, working against this sort of thing. As, as you know. So anyway, um, that is our primary mission is, is growing the grassroots army. And uh, you might say, well, okay, so what does Arizona do? Well, Arizona years ago passed the, the resolution. We are what we call a past state. So we passed the resolution. And you'd say from, from that, okay, well, then why is Dwayne standing up there in front of a crowd talking about all this stuff? Aren't we done? And, and the answer to that is no. Uh, we have to, uh, every day, make sure that our, our local uh, politicians and our state politicians are working in our best interest. That means that each one of you needs to, to think about how can, how can you help to, to make sure that our representatives are doing, what we, doing the people's business instead of whatever they do. Well, it means going to the school boards. It means maybe even you know saying, "Gosh, I'm going to run for the school board," um, you know that sort of thing. So um, we are asking everybody to join us in this grassroots army and, and make sure that we're work, working, uh, you know, along this path to restoring the the founders' original intent for the country. So I, I covered some of the progress already. We have 17 states. Arizona's passed the resolution. And uh, 
Wisconsin and Nebraska were the last two. We have some other some others in the hopper. They're they're partially through the legislative process. In many cases, we've got two or three that that uh, uh, potentially will will get there this you know this legislative season. We'll see. But this is a, 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 an ongoing effort uh, for for us at, at Convention of States because imagine you we've we passed we're a past state we we've, we've made sure that we can call the convention. But we know that at some point the opposition is going to try to take that away. I mean, that's the way uh, politics works, right? If somebody presents a new bill that's, that tries to take it away from us, then we'll have a, a struggle all over again if, if we were to let them get it, get it done. So we don't want to do that. We want, that's, that's why it's so important for the Convention of States to stay you know, out in front, uh, leading the charge to make sure that, that uh, this stays on the people's mind and we continue to make sure it's working. So here, here's a map of the states that have passed it. So in conclusion, um, I told you before, I think the, the, the federal government is essentially broken. It's, uh, it's dysfunctional. Uh, many, many of the uh, individual parts of the government are not working in the people's interest anymore. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have two levels of, of uh, justice system uh, for those that are connected and those who are not connected. And the framers of the Constitution, uh, in, their, in their genius, created Article 5 that allows us to, to do something about uh, government out of control. And it can be done legally and peacefully. So the path from uh, where we are to submitting the constitutional amendments is, as I said, it's not an easy one. You can imagine that all it takes is, is somebody in one committee in some of these states to say no, and it doesn't go. So the, the way that you get through uh, legislation through, whether it be this or some, you know, some bill that you, that you want, you've got to bring pressure on the politicians. They, they, they respond to their, uh, the people in their districts. If you call them, if you visit them, if you send them letters, they, they care. I mean, sometimes you wonder, but you can, I also see it from their position as well, because they, they are being pulled left, you know, left and right, up and down, all over the place, and they are, of course, uh, people just like we are, and, and the legislative, legislators in Arizona are not doing this for money. Um, what, 30,000 a year, is that what they, they, they make, Donna, something like that? Yeah, not even that, she says. So, so these are average people, you can talk to them. You, you, can, you can get in to talk to them, you can, um, they respond to handwritten letters especially because it's hard to ignore a piece of paper on your desk. Emails are okay, but you know, you know what we all do with our email, right? <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, we invite you to be part of this movement. We ask you to do something uh, little at first, which is just sign the, the uh, you know, sign the, the senior moment, excuse me. <laughs> sign the petition, please. <laughs> That's all I'm asking. Uh, anyway. And, and it's important because it, it, we have 60,000 petition signers in Arizona. It sounds like a big number, but uh, the bigger the number is, the, the more the, the politicians pay attention to us. And, and if we say we're going to help you uh, push through some legislation because it you know, fits with the Convention of States uh, mission, then it's a powerful thing. And the more, more people we can show them that have uh, signed up for this, better chance we have of, of having it happen and for them to support us in, in our mission. So, just in closing, um, let me say, uh, electing like-minded people to all these offices in DC and, and, and the state and even local is a good part of, of what we need to do. I don't discourage that at all. But it's not the, uh, the main problem. We don't have a, a staffing problem, if, if you like. What we have really is the, uh, the, the, the functional 
organization or the culture of, of around that is, is what we're trying to change. You know, the, the example I gave was term limits because if the politicians go to DC and they know that they're only going to be there for six years, say, they are going to be le much less likely to be sucked into the you know, pay for play games that uh, some of them get stuck in in, in DC. So anyway, um, I, do, uh, I could keep going. Um, We the people decide. Uh, the, the, the Constitution says that the, the power is, is given to the people and the states. You know, the, 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 the enumerated powers that are given to the, the federal government are fine. They are given to the federal government. Everything else is given to the states and the people. So take up the, take up the challenge to, to make your, your legislators uh, do, their, do their responsibility. Uh, make sure that they take back from the federal government things that the federal government shouldn't be doing.